So my name is Andrew Dauber. I am the uh, Chief of Endocrinology at Children's National Hospital in Washington, DC. Um, and as a pediatric endocrinologist, I see kids with all different types of uh, endocrine disorders, but my major area of personal interest in research is in growth disorders and short stature. So I myself do research on rare genetic forms of growth disorders, but I also uh, do a lot of clinical trials work in uh, the whole arena of growth disorders with novel therapeutics um, and various diagnostic techniques. Great question. So actually short stature is the most common reason for referral to a pediatric endocrinologist outside of diabetes. So it's a very common reason that we're seeing kids for an evaluation. And one of the you know, significant causes of short stature that we don't wanna miss is pediatric growth hormone deficiency. So growth hormone is made by the pituitary gland, a gland that sits, I always describe it as back between your eyes, under, you know, right under your brain. Um, it's the you know, master regulator of a number of different hormones, but including secreting growth hormone. And growth hormone is responsible for um, one of the major you know, players, obviously, in causing children to grow normally. So you can have growth hormone deficiency for a number of different re reasons. You can either be born with it uh, in a congenital form, or you can acquire it a little bit later in childhood. So the acquired growth hormone deficiency can happen um, due to a, a brain tumor, you know, rarely something like the most common one being a, a tumor called a craniopharyngioma, but anything that impacts on the pituitary gland itself. There are some other, you know, rare causes in children who have had radiation therapy for various cancers, severe head trauma, other things can cause growth hormone deficiency. Um, but then there are children who are born and it becomes more clear over time. They might have kind of anatomic abnormalities in the way the pituitary gland forms. So not all of the connections were made correctly. And as a result, the child has growth hormone deficiency either alone or sometimes as part of other uh, multiple pituitary hormone deficiencies. There are also rare genetic causes that can lead to uh, congenital growth hormone deficiency or children who had uh, brains that didn't 100% form correctly can also have associated growth hormone uh, deficiency. And it becomes obvious over the, you know, the years of life as the child's not growing normally, falling off of their growth curve. And then when we start to do a hormonal evaluation, we see that markers of how growth hormones working are low, suggestive of growth hormone deficiency. So um, up until really the last year or two, the only uh, available treatment for individuals with growth hormone deficiency was daily growth hormone injections, okay? And uh, recombinant human growth hormone has been available since the mid-1980s. Um, and now there are, you know, hundreds of thousands, now millions of people who have received it over the years. Um, and uh, it is a daily injection therapy where essentially you're replacing the hormone that has been missing. In the last uh, year or two, there have now been once a week forms of growth hormone. There, in, in the US at least, there are now three different weekly formulations of growth hormone that are approved for children with growth hormone deficiency just a longer acting version of that daily growth hormone. Sure. Um, so these two trials focus on a new approach, a medication called LUM201. And LUM201, instead of being an injection therapy, it's an oral growth hormone secretagogue. So it's a medicine that binds to those cells in the pituitary gland and at the level above that, at the hypothalamus as well, um, it binds to a receptor called the growth hormone secretagogue receptor. This receptor's job is to tell the brain and the pituitary gland to make more growth hormones, to secrete more growth hormone. So this new medication, uh, LUM201, the medication actually has been studied for a number of years, but in these new phase two trials, the idea was, can this oral medication help restore the the growth hormone secretion in children with milder growth hormone deficiency back to normal levels, okay? Um, and as I said, this medicine was studied a number of years ago, but what in a kind of later analysis of the data, what they realized was that in patients with severe growth hormone deficiency, you know, where maybe the pituitary gland is just not gonna be able to restore, right? There's some, you know, permanent abnormality or something where it doesn't have the capacity, 
this medicine is not appropriate for those patients. So these two new phase two trials, what they did was they selected patients who were likely to respond or have the ability to respond to an oral growth hormone secreted guide. And they did that using a strategy called a predictive enrichment marker or a PEM. And what they did was they looked at one of the growth hormone biomarkers, something called IGF-1, made sure that that level was okay. And then we gave a test dose in the trial of the LUM201 and saw that the patient was able to make growth hormone in response to that test dose. And in doing so, kind of, we were able to enrich for patients who would have a positive response to the LUM201. So the two different phase two studies, one study was a study looking at three different doses of LUM201 and comparing it to uh, daily growth hormone in patients that met, you know, those inclusion criteria with mild growth hormone deficiency, and then followed them the initial trial, uh, like the initial endpoint was for six months, but now following out to 12 months and now up to two years um, in some of the patients. And then the second trial was a study done led by a Dr. Fernando Casorla in Chile, um, where patients were randomized to one of two, the two higher doses of the LUM201. And there they did detailed physiologic studies to look at how much growth hormone those patients were secreting by very frequent sampling over a 12 hour period um, and looking at the amplitude of those growth hormone pulses and the frequency of those pulses compared to when those patients were not receiving the medicine. So maybe going back to and now in reverse order of how I um, uh, describe them. So in Dr. Casorla's trial, uh, looking at the uh, growth hormone secretion, what he, they were able to see was that with LUM201, it was able to restore growth hormone um, secretion to levels that are in the normal range, you know? Um, so was able to bring the, the, actually the amplitude of the growth hormone pulses got much higher in these patients um, on the medicine compared to when they weren't taking the medicine, showing that it's working and really, you know, uh, bring the body back to that normal growth hormone secretion in these patients with mild growth hormone deficiency. And that resulted in an increase in IGF-1 levels and in an increase in, growth velocity as well. And then in the other trial, what they found was uh, of the three doses, the 1.6 milligram per kilogram, which was the middle dose, really led to the optimal outcome in terms of growth rate and growth uh, velocity. So they found that at um, six months and 12 months, there was uh, an increase, the growth velocity went up from baseline, I'm just looking at the exact numbers, to around eight centimeters a year, approximately eight centimeters a year in patients on that middle dose. Um, and that was the target kind of growth velocity. If you look at historical data of patients with mild growth hormone deficiency, similar patients who were treated with growth hormone, they also have uh, a growth velocity in the eight, eight and a half centimeter range. So this was very encouraging that at this dose, we were able to achieve those types of growth rates using this oral growth hormone secreted guide. Now the growth hormone arm in this small study did grow even faster, um, but uh, it's still a small number of patients and there were a few outliers in the growth hormone arm that probably drove some of that better response. But overall, the study met all of its endpoints. They showed that the predictive enrichment marker strategy was reproducible. It uh, enriched for patients who would respond over seven, around 70% of the patients met a target for a positive response to the treatment. Um, and I think it was encouraging enough that uh, Lumos is uh, planning or hoping to now move forward with plans to make their phase three study uh, using that 1.6 milligram dose uh, is what they've indicated. Yeah, I think, you know, some of the data is still rolling in. So they've, you know, the six month data is all in. Um, but uh, not all of the patients have hit, I believe, the 12 month data, and they're even looking now out to two years to see how sustainable that was. Another thing, they're seeing some good results that the, the increase in growth velocity appears to be sustainable over time. So, definitely, I'm sure the company is going to keep collecting uh, the data and we'll get more of a readout as all of that data becomes available. 
Uh, but they've announced that they're planning on meeting with the FDA to have their end of phase two uh, meeting with the hopes of launching a phase three study, hope, from my perspective, hopefully as soon as possible, but maybe sometime in the next year. Now, I, I'd say maybe I could just comment on, you know, what's the potential role for this medication? You know, so when we were talking about the design of the trials, I was talking a lot about uh, the comparison between it, the LOOM201 results and growth hormone. But just as a practicing clinician, you know, it is clear in my mind that growth hormone is a very important medication for many patients and is always going to continue to have a role. But there are going to be those patients for whom uh, injection therapy is really, you know, something that they're not interested or willing to pursue. And there are going to be some patients who are going to respond just as well uh, to this oral growth hormone secreted oct, I hope, right? And there are, and even in my mind, if the, the responses are not always equivalent, to have another option on the market for patients with mild growth hormone deficiency, where they can take an oral medication and get an extra inch a year, you know, an extra, maybe even more than that, um, that's an amazing option. So, you know, I'm interested in, as a clinician, having therapies available for our patients with these relatively rare disorders, you know, and giving them options and being able to talk through those, you know, the, the benefits of each different approach. So uh, this is exciting for me that there could be an oral option on the horizon.